Well, it is certainly a pleasure to be at Gatlinburg. I've had the opportunity over the last several years to preach several times in the old building, the one that was destroyed by the fire. Then I preached several times in the temporary building. This is my first time in the new building. And you have done a beautiful job. I notice it's much lighter in this auditorium than it was in the old auditorium. And uh, always so good to be here. I say that I'm happy to be at Gatlinburg. I love the church here. But I also say, at my age, I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> I want you to know that the topics that we speak on during polishing the pulpit, even at various congregations, we do not choose. These are assigned to us. And we are asked to speak on particular topics. And the subject that has been assigned to me for this evening is, what is the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38? So let me begin by quoting Acts 2.38 to get the idea before us. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. A number of years ago, I taught a class on the book of Acts. And when I got to that verse in Acts 2.38, I knew that brethren had a difficult time trying to explain what was involved in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there were many different ideas about it. So I took a sheet of paper and I passed it around in the class. And I said, would each one of you in the class please write down on the paper what you understand the gift of the Holy Spirit is in Acts 2.38. When the paper went around and came back to me, there were 30 different answers. That gives you an idea of how brethren have struggled to understand and explain the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. Tonight, I am going to make it so plain that you will leave the auditorium knowing what the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38 is. And I know that's a pretty broad allegation. But I only make it because I studied the matter for years and years before I came to the conclusion that I'm going to present to you tonight. But I believe that I'll be able to show you from the Bible what is involved in this verse and this promise, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to begin, however, by pointing out the miraculous element of the Holy Spirit. You may remember that the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And that had been promised to them by the Lord before he went away. Well, even John the Baptist had said, there cometh one after me mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, Matthew 3 and verse 11. And then Christ said in Acts chapter 1 at verse 5, John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So here you have the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you follow the pronouns down through chapter 1 and into chapter 2, it is clear that the ones who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit were the apostles. 
Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, beginning of the church, apostles baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they were able to speak to the multitude on that day as they were led by the Spirit. The Lord had said in John 16, 13, that they would be guided into all truth. So we need to understand in the outset that there was a miraculous element to the Holy Spirit. The apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit. The word baptized simply means immersed. So they were immersed. They were covered up. They were submerged with the Holy Spirit. And they received miraculous power as a result of that baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then there's another element involved in the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way. And that is some received a gift of the Spirit by the laying on of the apostles' hands. And you find that in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts where it is talking about Samaria. And I'll come to that verse a little later. But I just want to point out now that there are two different miraculous elements involving the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit received by the apostles on Pentecost and the laying on of hands which also gave a miraculous gift to those who received it. Now what are the miraculous gifts that were imparted by the laying on of the apostles' hands? Well, they are itemized in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to refer to that now, beginning with verse 8 of that chapter, if you want to follow along. To one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. That's a spiritual gift. He's not talking here about wisdom you get uh, by experience. He's talking about a gift that was given miraculously by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Everybody did not get the same gift. Everybody did not have the same power. They received different gifts in the early church by the laying on of apostolic hands. So it is said in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 12, the one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, a miraculous gift of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith. And again, I want to point out, he's talking here about a miraculous measure of faith. Not just talking about faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, such as you and I have. But he's talking about some upon whom the apostles laid their hands and they were given the gift of faith, a miraculous gift of faith. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. That is, they were able to heal the sick. Further, to another, the working of miracles. Well, all of these are miracles in a sense, gifts of healing, for example. So what does he mean by saying that some received a gift of the working of miracles? Well, there were other miracles besides healing. Some were able to speak with other tongues. We'll get to that in a moment in the same list. Some were able to teach others. So some had the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. Some had the gift of prophecy, again, a miraculous gift, imparted by the laying on of apostolic hands. To another, discerning of spirits, that is, being able to tell whether the spirit was of God or not of God. First John 4, verse 1 Beloved, believe not every spirit, for there are many false prophets going out into the world. So some had a gift called discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. So we're not just talking there about the English tongue, 
the uh, German tongue, divers or diverse tongues, those were miraculous powers, whereby that one could speak in a language he had never studied. But God gave miraculous power that one could speak in other tongues. And finally, the last of these to another, the interpretation of tongues. If somebody spoke in a tongue, people in the audience might not understand that tongue, but someone was given another power. They were given the power to interpret what was uttered in a foreign language. So if you count those, there are nine spiritual gifts. Those spiritual gifts, one or the other of them, bestowed by an apostle laying his hands on an individual, and that individual received one of those miraculous gifts, knowledge or wisdom, working of miracles, prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, nine of them in the entirety that were bestowed. Now, why were these given? Well, bear this in mind. They did not yet have the completed written word. Most of the books, in fact, at this time, none of the books of the New Testament had been written. So when the church was established on the day of Pentecost, how in the world were people going to be guided? How were they going to know what was right and what was wrong? The answer is, they were given miraculous gifts. I've had a number of debates with uh, the Pentecostals. And you know, they claim to still have the gifts. They uh, claim to speak in tongues and have the gift of healing and so on. So there are a number of uh, these gifts that people still claim to have today. And one of the arguments that we make against that idea is that only an apostle could impart the gifts. Only an apostle could lay hands on someone and cause that person to have a miraculous gift. So when the last apostle died and the last person on whom an apostle had laid his hand, the gift ceased. That's why we teach, and I think correctly so, that you do not have the gift of tongues today. You do not have the gift of healing today. You do not have these miraculous measures that I have found itemized in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, how have our brethren tried to explain Acts 2.38? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. If you read the King James Version that I'm reading, it usually has the expression, Holy Ghost. The American Standard Version and most others speak of the Holy Spirit. But it's the same idea, just different terminology, depending on the translation that you utilize. So what is the gift of the Holy Ghost or the gift of the Holy Spirit here in Acts 2.38? Well, first I want to tell you what our brethren generally have said. And it's what I've tried to say for years, that the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38 is that common gift, by common they meant available to everyone in common, the common gift of the Spirit that is not miraculous. And I'm sure you've heard this idea, I've heard it all my life, that when you are baptized into Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. Not miraculous, non-miraculous, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. 
repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You receive a non-miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is the common explanation that I've heard given over the years and that I tried to give for a number of years. I don't believe it's correct. And I want us to examine a little bit here tonight to see if we can understand what is involved in the gift in Acts 2 and verse 38. First of all, remember that on that day of Pentecost, where Acts 2.38 was spoken, there were miracles performed. Remember that chapter starts out, there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And the multitude heard the sound, and they assembled all together. And you remember that Peter and the apostles spoke to them. And one of the things that were said in the sermon that was delivered on Pentecost was a quotation from an Old Testament prophet, the prophet Joel. And Peter said, this is that. You know, the multitude was amazed that the apostles could speak in other tongues. You had a lot of different nations represented on the day of Pentecost. Everybody could understand the message that was being delivered because the apostles were able to speak in various tongues. And in Acts 2 and verse 9, the question was asked, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Verse 8, how can we understand these people that are talking in languages that they never studied? So when uh, Peter tries to explain that to the audience, he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall and remember that prophecy was one of those spiritual gifts that people received by the laying on of the apostolic hands. So Peter quotes that here on the day of Pentecost. Then he comes along a little later and says to that great assembled multitude, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and he says, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to think about that a moment. If you had been in that audience on the day of Pentecost, and you had heard these individuals speak in other tongues, if you had seen the miraculous manifestations on that day, the sound is of rushing mighty wind. Cloven tongues, like as a fire, we're told, sat upon each one of them. And then you hear the explanation for all of those miracles. This is that spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Joel 2 and verse 28. And then when the command is given to you, it is said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, you repent, you're baptized, you come up out of the water. What do you have? See, our brethren... Too many times I've tried to explain that by saying, well, you have a non-miraculous gift. And you don't know any more when you come up out of the water than you did when you went down into the water. 
And if you had been in that audience on the day of Pentecost and had seen the miracles and had heard the miracles, and then the apostle Peter said that it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then repent and be baptized, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, what would you have expected? And so I concluded a number of years ago, and I believe it is right, that the gift of the Holy Spirit here in Acts 2.38 is not some non-miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit that a lot of uh, brethren have tried to explain. He is saying to them, you repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is, the apostles would lay hands on them and they would receive some miraculous gift such as they had seen and witnessed. And if you think about that a little bit, it really makes sense because they did not have a Bible. They did not have a New Testament. How were they to be guided? How was the church to be led before the New Testament was completed? And I believe the answer is quite obvious. It was by the imposition of these miraculous gifts. They had the word of wisdom. They had the word of knowledge. They had the various other gifts that are outlined in the 1 Corinthians 12 that we saw a little while ago. And so the early church, by the laying on of apostles' hands, received miraculous powers by which the church could be guided until such time as the New Testament was completed. All right, now I've told you what I believe the gift of the Holy Spirit is in Acts 2.38. Miraculous power, miraculous gifts imparted by the laying on of the apostolic hand. So that's what I came here to do. I can sit down. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> There's a little more to it than that. You know, uh, one way that we understand the Bible is by comparing verses that are all on the same subject. And this is what is a mystery to me. Why that brethren have not seen the parallels that identify what is meant by the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. It's so plain. It's so clear in the Bible. I'm a little like that uh, elderly lady that, oh, she loved to read the Bible. Preacher thought he would help her out. He gave her a set of commentaries. And she told him later, the Bible show does throw light on them commentaries. <laughs> she had discovered that there was something that was better than the commentaries, and that was to read various verses in the Bible that deal with the same topic. Well, let's go to another case of conversion. We're looking at the uh, conversion of the 3,000 on Pentecost in Acts 2. They're the ones that Peter said, repent, be baptized, remission of sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that is the first case of conversion, Acts chapter 2. Well, let's go over to chapter 8. And when we get over there, let's read about the people of Samaria. I'm reading in uh, Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 14. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Now mind you, Peter and John are in Jerusalem. But when the word came that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John from Jerusalem up to Samaria. Why? Stay with me. Who, when they were come down, 
prayed for them, that is, prayed for the Samaritans, that they might receive the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. I want you to notice there the word receive. That's the same word that is found in Acts 2 38. Repent and be baptized for the of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When the Samaritans heard the truth and obeyed it, they sent two apostles up there. Why? Well, Philip was the one that was preaching in Samaria. Philip was not an apostle. He could not lay hands on anybody and convey a miraculous gift. So they sent Peter and John, two apostles up there, that they might receive the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you know the way this is taught by so many today, repent and be baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're told that when people are baptized, they automatically receive some non-miraculous gift. Well, here it is said these people had been baptized, but they had not received. That ought to be enough to tell us it's not talking about some non-miraculous gift. Look at verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them. That's Peter and John. That's those two apostles from Jerusalem that they sent over there to Samaria when they heard those people had obeyed the gospel. Why do Peter and John come? Why do you need two apostles? They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, Acts 2 is a case of conversion. 3,000 on Pentecost. Acts 8, where we're reading, is a case of conversion at Samaria. Why can we not learn to look at parallel cases and by comparing them come to an understanding of what the gift of the Holy Spirit was in Acts 2? In Acts 8, it's very clear. When they were baptized, the apostles laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And then you have this occurrence if we read on to verse 18 of Acts 8. When Simon saw, that's Simon the sorcerer, as he was called, when Simon saw that through laying on, watch it, of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive, same word as Acts 2 38, receive the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. So, what did the Simon see? That through the laying on of, watch it, apostles, the Holy Spirit was given. Now, that's parallel to Acts 2. I believe that ought to tell us what the gift of the Holy Spirit was in Acts 2. It was miraculous power conveyed by the laying on of apostolic hands. Well, let's just go a little further and see what we can discover. We turn over a page or two in our Bibles and we come to the 10th chapter of the book of Acts and we read about the conversion of Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. And we go down to about verse 44 and we read, when Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, that is the Jews, which believed were astonished because on the Gentiles also was poured out, look at the language, was poured out the 
gift of the Holy Spirit. Exact same language as Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Household of Cornelius, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So what do you have in Acts 10? You have the conversion of Cornelius, and you have him receiving a miraculous, same language, gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm going to go to one other just to nail the matter down. Let's go over to Acts chapter 19. That's where we read about those 12 men that knew only the baptism of John. And you remember they had to make a second trip to the water because the baptism of John the Baptist was not effective after Christ came. So we read that there were 12 men. Paul came there and he said, Have you received, there's that same word, received, same word that's found in Acts 2.38, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? <clears throat> what is he asking them? Well, if those on Pentecost had the apostles' hands laid on them and they received a gift of the Holy Spirit, if those at Samaria had apostles' hands laid on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And if at the household of Cornelius they received the gift of the Spirit, very same language as Acts 2.38, and they spoke in tongues, that was a miraculous gift. Paul is saying to these men at uh, Ephesus, have you received the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit since you believed? They said unto him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. What did he know? He immediately knew their baptism wasn't right. Under what then were you baptized, he said. And they said, under John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ. John's baptism was a baptism of preparation before the coming of Christ. These individuals apparently had been baptized with John's baptism after Christ had come. And Paul is telling them that baptism is no longer in effect. But listen to the rest of it. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, what have they been baptized unto already? They've been baptized unto John's baptism. Peter taught them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. John's baptism was not administered in the name of the Lord. But one more verse I want us to see in Acts 19. Verse 6. When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, brethren, is that plain or not? I mean, I don't say you can make it much plainer than that. They knew only the baptism of John. Paul taught them better. And they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And it said Paul laid his hands on them. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Well, I can't cover everything. I hope I've covered enough to make this plain. But I want to close with one further point. Here's the question I always get. People say, well, you're saying then that the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38 is no longer 
in effect. Right. You're saying that it is no longer enforced. How can you say the first part of the verse applies to us, second part of the same verse does not? This applies to us. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then the rest of that verse says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How can you say this part applies and this part doesn't? I'm going to give you the clearest answer you ever heard. One of our favorite verses in Churches of Christ and ought to be a favorite with everybody everywhere is Mark 16 and verse 16. So let's look at it. Verse 15, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Does that apply to us today? Oh, yes. Oh, well, let's read the next verse. The very next verse. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. All of those are miraculous gifts. We have no problem separating those in Mark 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That applies to everybody still today. These signs shall follow them that believe. We don't believe those signs are still in force or in effect today. I believe that Mark 16 and Acts 2 are parallel. Mark 16 he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. These signs shall follow. Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How? By the laying on of apostolic hands to lead and guide the church until such time as they have the written revelation of God that we know as the New Testament. I just think Nothing could be plainer. If you read the parallel cases of conversion, if you read what the apostles did by the laying on of hands, there's no reason to suggest that Acts 2.38, gift of the Holy Spirit, is talking about something received by individuals today. My time is up. But you have been a wonderful audience. I'll have to say this. Every eye has been right up here. You have listened. You have been attentive. You have been respectful. I thank you. Now we come to the conclusion by asking if there should be any here subject to the invitation of our Lord in any public way. That is... Do you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins? Do you need to be restored to the work and the worship of the church? There's an opportunity provided just now. You could make your way to the front. The brethren here will assist you. You can either be baptized or if you're already a member of the church and have been baptized into Christ, you can be restored to the work, faith, and fellowship of the church of our Lord. Thank you for your consideration. Let's stand and sing the invitation.